chapter 2, we're down at verse 24. Uh, just remind us what we have been talking about. Nebuchadnezzar's had a dream. He doesn't remember the dream. Yet, he, when he called his magicians and his astrologers and, and people who interpreted dreams, or at least said they interpreted dreams, he, a he asked them to interpret the dream. And so the people said, well, just tell us the dream and we'll interpret it. And Nebuchadnezzar said, well, no, you tell me the dream. And, uh, and the interpretation, and uh, things will go well. However, if you cannot do that, basically I'm going to kill you. Uh, because uh, Nebuchadnezzar, if they it, it had, these people had said we can interpret dreams, and if they really could, they could also tell what the dream is. And this is the thing with psychics even today and astrologers. They can't do what they claim to do. They can make it seem like they can do this. But they are fooling you. They are con men and women. And they really can't do this. And the astrologer said, well, we can't, we can't do those things. And Nebuchadnezzar sent out the order. All these men need to die. And Daniel was included in that. He wasn't there uh, when the astrologers uh, were threatened this way. But he was among the wise men. And even Daniel was... Uh, was said that. And Arioch came to Daniel, and Daniel said, well, what's the big fuss all about? And so he explained it, and Daniel stood before Nebuchadnezzar and said, give me some time. I'm going to pray to God, and then I will come back with the interpretation. But it was going to be God who gave the interpretation, and God appeared to Daniel in a vision, and Daniel blessed the Lord. The Lord was looking out for Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar's threat was very real. If had God done nothing, Daniel would have died. But God was protecting Daniel. Daniel, he, he, the dream was sent from God in, in himself, uh, as we're going to find out this evening when it comes to the dream and the interpretation of it. Uh, but uh, God was going to be glorified through the interpretation he gave Daniel. And so let's get the dream itself. Let's get verses 24 to 35. We'll get Henry and then Deanna over to Bill and Tammy. We'll do three verses each. Uh, Daniel 2, verses 24 to 35. Therefore, Daniel went to Aroka, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of the Babylon. Take me before the king. I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Arika quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Bashur, uh, are you able to make known to me the dream which you have seen and its interpretation? 27, 28, 29, yeah. Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanter, enchanter, magician, or astrologer can show the king the mystery that the king but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the vision of your son as he lay in bed are these. To me, O King, as he lay in bed, came thoughts of what would be after this, and he who reveals mysteries but as for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than any of my brethren. But for our sake, to make known the interpretation to the king, I 
and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and sides of bronze. Its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out with hands struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together, and became like chaff from the summer threshing floor. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. All right, so we have here this dream. First of all, before we get there, Daniel went to Ariat and said, so I want to stand before the king. I'll tell the king the interpretation, which of course many also would tell the king the dream. But you can't know the interpretation if you don't know the dream. And so Ariok went to the king and said, I found this man Daniel among the captives of Judah. He'll make known the, to the king uh, uh, the interpretation. And Nebuchadnezzar basically said, Daniel, speak. You can tell me the dream interpretation. What was the, before Daniel got to the dream though, what did Daniel make clear? What did he make clear to Nebuchadnezzar? There wasn't anything to do with his wisdom. Yeah. Was it, it wasn't him who was giving him the interpretation, the dream and the interpretation. It wasn't him. I'm reminded of what Moses told Israel in Deuteronomy. God didn't select you because you were the most powerful nation, or you were the most numerous of people, or you were the best people. He didn't choose you because of that. He chose Abraham, a man of faith, but he could have chosen anyone. There were other faithful people in that time other than Abraham. We know of Melchizedek in Salem. We know that there were other faithful people. That's why the Amorites, uh, the land of the Amorites wasn't given directly to Abraham. Because the sins of the Amorites were not yet full. So there were still some righteous people. God could have selected anyone. He selected Abraham. Abraham had traits that God liked. And Israel was selected based on God's mercy and God's grace. Well, Daniel here is saying, don't think of me. The, these other astrologers, they, they would have given you the interpretation based on their wisdom. It would have been their interpretation. Could have been right, could have been wrong, most likely would have been wrong. Because this, this dream here is not like a dream that you would normally have that probably would have a, a simpler interpretation. And so Daniel's saying, this is God. There is a God in heaven. You need to know that there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, or reveals secrets. And he was even the one who sent the dream. He was going to show you about things which would take place in the future. And you're going to get to know what these things are. That's a, that's a thing that men and women seek to know today. Wouldn't it be great? We knew what was going to happen to us tomorrow with certainty. We all have plans of what's going to happen tomorrow. Tomorrow's the first day of school in a lot of the province. Kids have a general idea. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to, I'm going to meet my teachers, meet my friends. I'm going to do these things. However, there are things that could intervene and prevent us from doing those things. We don't know. We have plans, but we don't know. Nebuchadnezzar here is going to be given a dream in which what was said was going to happen. That was quite a blessing that Nebuchadnezzar had. Because we don't all get to know the future. We don't know how old we're going to be when we die. We don't know if we're ever going to get married or not. We don't know what's going to happen to our children if we have children. What's going to happen when our, with our job. What's going to happen with this country or the world. If we could know those things, we think we'd be better off, but I don't think we would be. Because then, then if we actually saw what could happen, it's never guaranteed that what's happening is going to be good. 
and that we're going to enjoy what was revealed to us. But Nebuchadnezzar was going to be blessed. What was the what was what what was the thing he saw? Statue. All right, so it was a statue. It was it was a, it was a different looking statue though. Why was it different? Most statues are made out of one material. Okay, so yeah. So most of the time we see a statue. It's usually made out of stone uh, and usually one material. There might be the a pedestal. It might be marble, and 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 then the statue itself made of something different. But the statue would all be made of the same thing. If it didn't, if it wasn't, it would look strange. Because this is what we're used to seeing. This image here looked strange. What were the materials? Stone, shovel, glass, iron, brick. These are also things that don't go together. We don't usually mix with gold and silver. We don't usually mix silver and bronze. And we don't usually mix mixed, uh, bronze and iron. And clay. Like as far as we, these things can make alloys. Some, sometimes we might use a little bit, but we don't usually mix these things. It was, we started with a head of gold. Then we got the breast, the breastplate, the shoulders of silver. Come down to the waist. Oh, that's bronze. And then we get the, the feet and the toes of iron and soft clay, iry clay, moldable clay. What do you notice about the materials as you go down the statue? Start at the top and go down. What do you notice about the materials? Okay, so as we go down, we're eventually getting weaker material. And that's because, of course, it's inferior material. Take gold, and, and if you actually have like a gold nugget or rock, that's a pretty hard rock. Silver, uh, silver is a, a little less precious than gold, but it's pretty hard too. Then you get down to bronze. Bronze is a lot easier to mold than gold or silver. It doesn't require as much heat. It can become very brittle too. And then of course, iron and miry clay, we mold into a lot of things even today. But it's cheaper as you go down. Price of gold last time I saw is about $1,800 an ounce. Uh, uh, in American dollars today. Silver is a fraction of that. I can't remember what its price is. But then you go down to copper and bronze, and we're talking dollars, not hundreds of dollars anymore. Iron is not going to be as expensive either. And, uh, all right, now as we go down the statue, when we get to the bottom, what's different about the feet and the toes compared to even all of the other three materials. It's a mixture. It's a mixture. And what might that, what, if we actually did that, we're not talking about its interpretation yet, we'll get there. But if, if we actually did that with, with iron and clay, what would that do? Well, iron's stronger than iron. Yeah, yeah. So if you had solid iron, that's still pretty strong. But if you took iron and you shaved it up and, and you put it in with clay, now you've weakened. The clay is pretty brittle in itself, and at like as far as it, it's it's a mixture, and that's going to be important. Because the, the head is going to be is completely gold. It's not gold mixed with silver. It's gold. The breastplate is completely silver. The waist is completely bronze. And we get down to the feet and the toes. That's a mixture. 
That's going to be important when we get to the interpretation. But there's another part of this dream besides the image. All right, so what, 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 what's special about this stone? What's interesting is when it says it was cut out for a dream. All right. Now, like I said, all the, we, we have to mine gold and silver. We have to mine the copper that we're going to put into bronze. Have to mix the, uh, like as far as we have to get the iron ore out of the earth. Dig all that stuff up. Refine it, purify it. The stone here wasn't cut out by man. It was cut out without hands. And what did it do? What did it do? The stone stopped the image by the feet of iron. Okay, now first thing it did. What, what was the first thing it did? It's, it, you're, you're right. But where did it hit first? It's easy to miss. It's hit its feet. Now, if this was a normal, forget, forget for a second that we know that this is interpretation. Why do you suppose the stone would hit the feet? What would that do to the statue? Bring it all down. If I threw a stone at the head, I might lop off the head, but the rest of the statue might stay stand. If I lop off the, the shoulders, well, I'll get maybe the head and the shoulders, but the bottom would still stay standing. However, if I go right for the feet, the entire thing's going to crumble. I believe that's important in, our, in the interpretation that the stone went after the feet of the iron and the miry clay. And the rest of it came tumbling down. They were crushed together like chaff. Just like chaff you can take in your hand and you flick it out into the wind. These are all hard metals. You can't do that. If you have a gold nugget and took a hammer to it, it's hard to crush gold. Hard to crush silver and bronze and and, and iron. Hard to do that. And yet this stone, which was cut without hands and seemingly struck without hands, was able to just pulverize the statue. And what happened to the stone after it did that? Yeah, it became... He became a mountain. He became a mountain. So we have a stone. Uh, we're, we're probably taught like a boulder here. And the boulder didn't remain a boulder. It grew. Now that doesn't happen either. That rocks grow. Rocks are dead. They're not alive. And so the boulder grew. It became a mountain in and of itself. It filled the whole earth. Now, if a mountain actually did that, that would be quite something. And so, yeah, this is a strange dream. And, he, and I can understand why Nebuchadnezzar was confused. What could this be talking about? So now let's get the interpretation. 36 to 45, we'll do, we'll do uh, let's see. All right, so we'll do two verses each, and I'll get the last set of verses. 36 to 45, we'll do Henry, Dion, Bill, and Tammy. Two verses each. This is a dream. Now we are here in preparation of our age before the king. You, O king, are king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And into whose hand he has given to whoever they were, the children of man, the beasts of the and the birds of the heaven, and to the rule over them all. You are the head of gold, and not a kingdom into your city shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of one 
Kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall be not, not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king with what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. And so uh, Nebuchadnezzar was described here as a great king, a king of kings. When we hear the phrase king of kings, who do we normally think of? Jesus. Jesus is the king of kings. Well, Nebuchadnezzar was described that way here by Daniel through God. You are a great king. Nebuchadnezzar's empire was stretching the farthest many empires of that day it was a great and grand empire went all the way down into egypt and africa went all the way west into what we would call iran and and most likely afghanistan today uh, as far as it went and it went down to the persian gulf it covered vast amounts of territory he was a great king he was the head of gold I know we know what the rest of this interpretation is. However, it's not named who these other kings are. We are going to be introduced in this book to the shoulders of silver and to the waist of bronze. We are not going to be introduced in the book to the fourth king. Uh, the, the legs of iron, uh, which would be then mixed with the clay. Uh, I do want to make note, though, even though we will not identify uh, the, the kingdoms here, we'll wait until we get to those parts of the book, and then we will name uh, the, the fourth kingdom. Uh, we can understand from Scripture who the fourth kingdom is, and we'll discuss that a bit, too, uh, when we get into later on in this book. There are four kingdoms here. Premillennialists today try to make five. They try to make a fifth kingdom because they don't believe the kingdom has come. And the reason why they try to make a fifth kingdom, it, it, is, it, it, in, it, it is in verse 43, And as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men. They will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. And in these days, the king, God of heaven, will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. So a lot of people think, well, we know the four kings. And we know it's the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. And we come along and we say, uh -huh. well, Jesus' kingdom didn't come in the days of the Romans, so there must be a fifth kingdom, Rome, the, the remnants of the Roman Empire and other nations. And usually you hear in premillennial talk this one world order, and there is new world order that's going to come together. And in the days of those kingdoms, of the Battle of Armageddon and everything else. And it's just a hodgepodge of misunderstanding when it comes to scriptures. The iron mixed with clay. We know one thing about the Romans if you know history. The Roman Empire started as a republic. And then, in the days of Julius Caesar, it became an empire. And 
The thing about the the thing about the Roman Empire was it was unlike these other empires. The the Nebuchadnezzar, when he took Daniel and the and the uh, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the other nobles, what did he do with them? He didn't throw them in jail. What did he do? What did he train them in? Train them in Chaldean, and they learned culture. He was trying to make them Chaldean. He gave them Chaldean names. And they learned the culture. He wanted them to become Babylonians. He wanted them to become those things. The Medes and the Persians would do something similar. They, they wanted people to become them. And the Greeks much the same. The Romans were different. And we know this from the New Testament. You could be anything you wanted in the Roman Empire. As long as you were loyal to Caesar and paid your taxes. You could be a Jew, you could be an Egyptian, you could be a Greek, you could be uh, whatever you wanted. They didn't care. And as we know, when a country rallies around a certain cause, they are more united. However, when we add different cultures into the mix, nothing wrong with different cultures. But a nation typically probably will not be as strong if there isn't an identifying culture of the nation, even if there are subcultures in that larger culture. We know that in the Roman Empire, where the Roman Empire really died from within of a rot, and that allowed others to come in and attack it once it got so big and so and so rotten from the to the core that it was easy it was easier to defeat because it wasn't as strong people didn't have the attachment to rome that they would have had they been roman they just followed caesar because caesar was the big power once caesar wasn't the big power well don't have to follow him anymore we'll follow somebody else it was in the days of the fourth kingdom that God would send a kingdom which would never be destroyed, that stone out of the mountain. That's the most important part of the dream. We focus on the four empires, and we think that's what the dream's about. The dream's not really about those empires. It's about getting to the kingdom of God, the kingdom that would never end. The kingdom that would stand forever. And of course, that's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of Jesus Christ. A mountain is a figure of speech for a kingdom in scripture. We read of the mountains of the Amorites. We read of the kingdom of Babylon being described as a mountain. And God's kingdom, of course, being described as a mountain. Mount Zion. And so the kingdom... Just like the stone grew, the kingdom would encompass the whole world. There would be no borders to this kingdom. Because it would encompass the whole world. Christ's kingdom can be have anyone in it. And it is strong. It is ruled by the king of kings, which is Christ. And Daniel ends the dream by saying it is certain. It is sure it will happen, and it did happen, just as Daniel said. Let's get verses 46 to 49 before we run out of time. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face prostrate before Daniel and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts. And he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also Daniel petitioned the king and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Now, the king here is going to reward Daniel for his interpretation. I, I do like to note here that in verse 47, Nebuchadnezzar did acknowledge God. 
But he didn't acknowledge him as the only God. He is the God of gods to Nebuchadnezzar. He, might, he is the supreme God among all of the other gods. And when you know a little bit about polytheism, you always know that there is a hierarchy of gods. You have gods that are more powerful than other gods. And so Nebuchadnezzar said, well, your God, the God of, uh, of the Jews, he is a God over all these other gods. And that will come into play when we get to Daniel 3 and the image that Nebuchadnezzar had uh, set up in that chapter that people had to bow down to. Let's not think here in Daniel 2 that Nebuchadnezzar became a full believer in God of Israel and only that God. He knew about this God, which is a star. That truly is a star. That he recognized that this God could reveal secrets, that this God is the Lord of kings. He is the God of gods. Now we just got to get Nebuchadnezzar to leave behind all those other gods because they're false. And so Daniel got promoted. He, he was given many gifts. He was made to rule over the province of Babylon. That's not the entire kingdom, by the way. That's just the province. And he became the chief administrator of the wise men. He, he became the head guy. And Daniel didn't forget his friends. He petitioned for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, they, they became uh, over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Daniel was even over them. I'd like us to quickly consider the providence of God in fulfilling his will. God was going to bring the Savior into the world through Israel. Israel's captivity was not going to stop this. God helped the righteous here, Daniel and his friends, while punishing the wicked, even those, those false interpreters. God, God's favor for the righteous was when they obeyed in faith. <coughs> Daniel didn't trust in his own knowledge, in his own wisdom. He always trusted in God and God to reveal the dream. But moreover, we see God is in control of the world. It's very easy to say that this is what's going to happen. It's harder to do it before it even happens. God gives us free will. God allows us to act. God doesn't force us to do anything. Yet God can still tell the future, and that confuses a lot of people. I, I sometimes will, will uh, compare it to a chess master. A chess master doesn't matter what moves you make. You can make every move you want freely. The chess master is going to beat you because the chess master knows all the moves you can make and will be able to win in spite of your moves. God is always able to tell the future because God is all known. He knows his creation better than we know ourselves. And he rules in the affairs of man. God said these kingdoms were going to rise. God would make sure that they rose. God makes kingdoms rise, makes kingdoms fall. He does so even today, even though we don't know. I am not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to...